independent republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Good afternoon, I'm JJ Nisiobi in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Coming up, there are fears a retaliatory attack by Iran on Israel could be imminent. It's after Israel killed two Iranian generals in an airstrike in Syria. Also, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling suggested she won't forgive the franchise's stars for attacking her stance on transgender issues. Previously, Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson spoke out in support of transgender rights after the writer was criticised for her comments. Boris Johnson has slammed Rishi Sunak's smoking ban as absolutely nuts and mad. We want your views on that. And Prince Harry's US visa application is being reviewed by a judge following his admissions about his use of drugs in his memoir, Spare. So, should the Duke be concerned about his right to reside in LA? And it's your call. This show is all about your response and your opinions. We're asking this question. Do you agree with Boris Johnson that Rishi's proposed smoking ban is absolutely nuts? The lines are open now. 0344 499 1000. Give me a call. Or text me on 8722. Or on the socials, it's at Talk TV. But first, let's get the headlines with Katie Pilbeam. Thank you, JJ. Good afternoon. A former post office managing director has apologised to a sub postmistress who was pregnant when she was wrongly convicted over the Horizon IT scandal. David Smith said he was sorry for an email telling staff that the jailing of Seema Misra was brilliant news. He's told the inquiry into the Horizon IT scandal that he was told the faulty software was pretty much tamper-proof. If they believed that they were going to deliver the programme, then why would they want anybody else to look at it? Um, was kind of the thinking that I got. And if the boot had been on the other foot, I don't think we as an organisation, as in Royal Mail Group or Post Office Limited, would have accepted a third party reviewing our programme of activity either. A 25-year-old man has been remanded in custody, accused of stabbing a mother to death in Bradford on Saturday. Habiba Mazoum is accused of killing Kasuma Akhtar as she was pushing her baby in a pram. There are fears of a retaliatory attack by Iran on Israel could be imminent. Well, it's after Israel killed two Iranian generals in an airstrike on its consulate in Syria. The U.S. president has vowed to support Israel. Joe Biden said the U.S. commitment to Israel is ironclad. The independent foreign affairs correspondent Mary Dejevsky told Talk TV Biden was sending a clear message to Iran. It's interesting that the, the terms that um, President Biden was talking in he was obviously directing his um, his assurances in two directions. He was addressing it to Iran, basically as a threat to Iran, of the, that um, the US would be absolutely be behind Israel. Well, it comes as the Israel military says it's killed three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh. All of them worked for the Hamas military. They're among the highest profile targets to be killed in Gaza so far. A major power plant near Kyiv was completely destroyed by Russian strikes. Chebrilia power plant was the largest provider of electricity for three regions, including Kyiv. A property tycoon in Vietnam has been sentenced to death after one of the biggest fraud trials in the country's history. Trung Man Lang was found guilty of embezzlement, bribery and violations of banking rules. Her company, Van Tin Fat, was accused of fraud amounting to $12.5 billion, nearly 3% of the country's GDP in 2022. Margot Robbie's production company is to produce a new film based on the classic board game Monopoly. The actress says she wants to make more films that have the effect Barbie has. That's the latest news for now. Let's get some weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, plenty of sunshine to be had across much of the UK for this afternoon, but not 
everywhere. Across southern areas of the UK, we've got a cold front that's lingering. That's bringing with it cloudier skies at times and some patchy light rain and drizzle. And it won't be a blue sky day for many areas. There will still be some cloud floating around, but there will be some good spells of sunshine for most of Scotland, Northern Ireland, England and Wales away from the south where it may stay quite murky as well. And in the sunshine, it is feeling pleasantly mild. In fact, we could see the highest temperature of the year so far around some parts of East Anglia or the East Midlands up to around 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. If it gets close to 21, it will be the highest of the year so far. Overnight, it remains mild. We are seeing spells of rain moving across much of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England for a time as well, perhaps for the northwest of Wales. But the rest of England and Wales stay mostly dry. And as I said, a very mild night again. Tomorrow will be another mild day, but this time across northern and western areas, it will stay unsettled with outbreaks of showery rain over Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern England at times. The rest of England and Wales seeing some good spells of sunshine and temperatures slightly higher than today. Locally, they could get up to 22 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. On to our top story now, and President Biden has pledged his ironclad support to Israel amid fears Iran is set to carry out reprisals for an Israeli airstrike that killed two Iranian generals. We also want to address the Iranian threat to launch a significant, they're threatening to launch a significant attack on Israel. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. The president warned Iran against carrying out an attack. U.S. intelligence said a missile strike could be imminent. An Israeli drone strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria on the 1st of April killed seven people. Both Iran and Syria have condemned Israel for the attack. Now with me to discuss this and the rest of the day's main news stories is former Conservative Special Advisor Charlie Rowley. Charlie, Biden there in darker shades than even me. But <laughs> <laughs> is he right to stand so resolutely with Israel? Uh, I think he is, yes, on this occasion. And it comes days after he was quite critical of Israel in terms of their um, uh, uh, attacks on those uh, humanitarian aid vehicles um, yeah. and said that you know, the support for uh, Israel in terms of the conflict in Gaza wasn't um, uh, uh, unconditional. So um, it's a, a step in the right direction, I think, in terms of reaffirming his support for Israel because of the threat that, uh, in terms of the destability, the destabilisation uh, within that region. Should he not be trying to be more diplomatic and be trying to maybe reach out to the Iranians? And, I mean, look, the, the fact is, uh, Israel broke the, the conventions there by attacking a consulate, right? That, in terms of diplomacy, that's a complete no-no. So surely Biden should be acknowledging that and, and trying to not necessarily befriend the Iranians, but try and just be a bit more diplomatic to both sides rather than saying, if you, if you go anywhere near Israel, we're going to support Israel ironclad. Well, I think that um, it could happen, but you've also got the conflict within the Red Sea. So, you know, the Houthis, who are uh, another terrorist organisation that have been uh, clogging up those shipping containers within the Red Sea, where you saw um, uh, UK warships, uh, ships sort of targeted by um, uh, uh, Iranian-backed uh, uh, the Houthi group. So, um, you know, it's a, a conflict that is um, ongoing in different parts of the region where I uh, Ir Iran is playing a huge part in terms of the destabilization of that region. It is obviously mm -hmm. anti-Israel. Uh, it is pro-Hamas. Uh, it is pro-Houthi. So you're, you know, establishing very, very clear dividing lines between who your enemies are. Uh, and uh, that's why President Biden has been so resolute in his support for, uh, for Israel. Well, why did Israel attack the Iranian consulate? They knew that that would be crossing a red line. Absolutely. No, countries do not attack embassies in other countries. Why do they think it's OK to, to go ahead and do that? Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I don't know what the, uh, the justification would be. But, I mean, you know, um, uh, there have to be questions over Israel's uh, targeting. As I say, you know, moments ago, about the, um, uh, the humanitarian aid vehicles, where they say that it was uh, obviously not targeted. It might have been a, uh, an, an error. You um, say there must or... be questions over it, Charlie. And I know you're not here to, to defend Israel, mm. but... I feel like every, every other week we're hearing people saying we've got to ask questions about Israel and, mm. and, and their tactics because it's now 200 is the number estimated of aid workers killed. 200 in six months. And now they're attacking uh, consulates in, in other countries. This is 
this is Israel are doing whatever Israel wants to do, and they're kind of just getting away with it on the world stage, and everyone's saying we should probably question this, but no one actually is questioning it. Even Biden, who criticised them for it, is now then turned around and said, no, no, actually they've got my full support. Yeah, and the, you know, the, you can't just give carte blanche support to another country that is going to, um, as I say, carry out. Uh, 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 you know, some of the things that it has done, such as you know targeting those um, humanitarian vehicles, whether or not it knew that it was doing that, or whether it thought it was a, a another set of well, vehicles that was taking yeah, they, place. They, they but, claim it was a mistake. But, but uh, they claim it was. A, but, but three Britons have died uh, in that, and so it's absolutely right that the prime minister of this country hauls uh, you know uh, President Benjamin Netanyahu over the, the the coals. It's right that President Biden does the same. Uh, and when it comes to um, uh, the amount of civilian ca casualties and then civilian life that has been lost in Gaza, Palestinian life, uh, that is uh, over and above what you'd expect any conflict. So it's right that, you know, uh, I think most people now are calling for the conflict to come to an end, whether that's through a ceasefire, whether that's through a humanitarian pause, whatever mm -hmm. language you want to use. It's vital that we actually protect those civilians on the ground, that aid gets to where it needs to. But also, there still has to be the pressure put upon Hamas uh, to release the hostages that they've taken uh, and also to bring Hamas to, uh, uh, to justice for the crimes that it that is committed, not just on the 7th of October, uh, but for what it does uh, throughout that region. Fair, fair point. I mean, in terms of the number of civilians, estimated at just over 30,000 now, but those numbers are coming out of, uh, from, from Hamas. So we should take it with a, with a small pinch of salt. Um, but let me, let's go back to, to what the Israeli Foreign Minister, Israel Katz, said. Uh, after the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, when he used the speech warning, they're going to they're gonna retaliate imminently, the Israeli Foreign Minister said... If Iran attacks from its territory, Israel will react and attack in Iran. But I want to focus on that word, territory. If Iran attacks from its territory. So you spoke earlier about this axis of resistance, Hezbollah, the Houthis, other factions in Syria and Iraq. If they continue and they attack, technically, technically speaking, that's not from Iranian territory. Mm. So Iran, and they're already acting through Hezbollah and the Houthis. They could just continue to do that, no? Uh, they can and they probably will. And then um, Israel can't can't attack can't then go and bomb Iran because Iran can say, well, we didn't do it from our territory. This is this is one, one of the factions who did this. And and Iran's capability in terms of its weapons is um, uh, it's uh, pitiful. Is is is, is and it, it is um, uh, you know only going to be uh, brought to an end I think by involving other partners. And so Egypt you know, need to get involved. You know the Saudis need to sort of step up. You know they are brokering some of those negotiations currently between Israel and Gaza. But you're absolutely right. You know uh, the threat that Iran poses um, on, on that particular region, particularly through the Red Sea, its um, involvement in funding those organisations and training troops for people that go on to fight for the Houthis and fight for Hezbollah uh, in these sort of guerrilla war type sort of situations, you know, yeah. um, they need to be uh, 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 followed very, very closely. But it's a uh, just a testament to how destable uh, and how de destabilised that region is. Hamas have also said, regards this ceasefire, that they don't have the hostages needed to complete this ceasefire. From, from what Israel are asking, um, I think they, they want... 40 females to be released, and Hamas is saying, we don't have that, which makes me essentially fear the worst for the hostages mm. um, who are still being held by these terrorists. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, um, uh, you know, there has to be a brokering of that negotiation. I know that's what um, Egypt and the Saudis are currently doing. But um, uh, it is... Uh, only going to create more tension uh, the longer that those conversations go on and the longer uh, that Israel are obviously asking for those particular hostages to be released. Uh, and if Hamas are saying, well, um, uh, we don't have them, you know, obviously questions are going to be asked, well, what does that mean? Are they still uh, alive? Are they still being captured? Are they still... Uh, or are they missing? Uh, uh, that is obviously going to be um, a heartbreak for the families mm -hmm. you know, who are having to hear these conversations played out. But I think Israel um, uh, you know, has a right to demand, obviously, that those hostages be returned. Absolutely. Um, Hamas is a terrorist organisation. It's carried out terrible atrocities. And although, uh, yes, of course, questions will be asked of Israel just in terms of its response because of the number of civilian casualties that have taken place in Gaza, um, the reality is... Um, uh, Hamas uh, infiltrate themselves within the community, within Palestine, within Gaza. So, you know, they are um, uh, uh, right through hospitals, through schools, through the community. They are very difficult to get at, yeah. which is why Israel will say that the response has to be uh, so forceful uh, because uh, otherwise these people are just going to remain in hiding and they'll be able to come out and attack again. So, look, the, I, feel, I think it's quite clear on the world stage, in the Western world at least, the, the support for Israel has started to swing a little bit away from it. 
But even in Israel, the, their own citizens are becoming quite critical of Benjamin Netanyahu. Any failing government needs something to unite the country, something for, something for people to get behind. Is that Iran now? Um, I, it, it could be, because I think of the threat that they pose, and they continue to pose, and have posed for, for a long time. Uh, but just on that point that you were saying earlier on, JJ, I mean, look, you know, I've, you've got many um, uh, Jewish friends who, um, uh, you know, the last thing that they want to see is any more uh, civilian life lost. You yeah. know, um, however difficult it is, and how, you know, passionate, obviously, they feel and patriotic about their country, and, you know, an attack that they've had to endure, um, however, you know, grotesque and, and horrible it was, um, they still do not want to see this conflict go on any longer than it needs to. They don't want to see uh, lives lost in uh, Gaza. They want mm -hmm. to see humanitarian aid in. They want it brought to an end. Obviously, they want the hostages released as well. But it is a, a humanitarian uh, a crisis now. And um, many people, Jews and uh, Muslims alike, people that live in Israel, people that live in Palestine, I think everybody and everyone on the international stage that you were just saying does want this conflict to, to come to an end. But um, when you have players like Iran that continue to pop up uh, and uh, cause even more trouble, you know, just adding more layers to the complexities of a mm -hmm. conflict, um, it's, it's not helpful, which is why Biden has um, had to, uh, first of all, criticise, I think, Benjamin Netanyahu and now throw his full support behind him. So it's, it's, it's uh, slim margins. Extremely slim. So let's move close to home now. Sickness benefits claims rise by a third in Tory heartlands. You must be devastated by this news, Charlie boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, just another headline for uh, the, you know, the number 10 sort of uh, spin doctors to try and uh, uh, come up with. I mean, I, I, I read the piece, I was talking about it, funny enough, uh, earlier on this morning, and it's, um, it's an interesting one. I mean, overall, I mean, there, there is a higher percentage now of people, uh, or it is a higher percentage of people uh, in recent, uh, uh, in the, since the recent sort of uh, survey, I think, where people in conservative constituencies are now uh, uh, applying for sickness benefit. Overall, the total number of people yeah. uh, that are on uh, sickness or incapacity benefit are from Labour constituencies. That's in <laughs> the piece. So the headline is slightly... Um, uh, yeah. uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, just headline-grabbing, I suppose, in that sense. But but you're right, and it comes down largely to mental health. You know, lots of mm -hmm. people are uh, struggling in this country, still, I think, on the back of COVID. Uh, uh, perhaps sort of the flexibilities of working from home, not being able to do so anymore, just adjusting to back to what was normal life before, mm -hmm. um, uh, and having those you know, years taken away if you're a young person. Um, but I think the other thing to say in conservative areas, and there are quite affluent conservative areas, some of these constituencies, and I think we sort of worry, you know, and, and ask ourselves, why is so much funding when it comes to the NHS or whatever going to those particular constituencies, like the home counties, for example, which you think are very affluent anyway. Yeah. And it tends to be because there is an ageing population, and therefore, you know, with an ageing population and more older people, you're going to see more of those people use those services, therefore more money needs to go to uh, those particular areas. So it's a, a, a difficult balance to strike, but you're right, you know, um, it is never good to hear uh, that uh, more people are, are, are claiming um, sickness benefit due to mental health or any other um, uh, uh, ill health, for that matter. Look, don't forget, it was your mate, Rishi Sunak. I know you're not actually friends with him, but it was... It was... Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I thought we were. <laughs> but your... I heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> it's your mate Sunak who said when he was campaigning to be leader uh, that he was going to reverse all of the, the things that Labour had put in place and to take the money from the inner cities and bring them back out to those areas that are already affluent. Uh, but as we say, I know this, head, this headline is misleading, you're right, because it's still Labour areas, it's still inner city areas where, um, where mental health is the worst and uh, uh, benefits claims are up. And yet, it's, this is down to the Tories, surely. It's 14 years. You say COVID, I would say the cost of living. I would say the fact that this country is an absolute mess. The fact that we've got uh, NHS waiting lists through the roof the Tories have pretty much decimated the country. I'm not surprised that mental health uh, is, is increased so much. 69% of all cases, mental health is the reason for, the, for these claims. See, there's, um, there's a lot in there um, uh, <laughs> that you've just listed. And, I mean, uh, look, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, there are many, many challenges that the, the, this government and the government has got to, uh, to get a grip of. Um, including the health of the nation, where there are backlogs still, on, I think, on the back of COVID. There was a big COVID bill uh, that had to be paid, which was there to protect people's lives and their livelihoods, the yeah. furlough scheme and all the rest of it. So, which, which the Tories implemented. That, you know, it's against Tories' fault, and, giving out free money. And, uh, I, you know, which was 
broadly accepted by, by the majority <laughs> of people at the time. I didn't hear any opposition to, 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 to the, the time, but, you know, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. <laughs> but, but I think um, uh, you, you're right, you know, but over the course of the 14 years, you know, what have the you know, Conservatives had to deal with? Well, they've been in the coalition government, which sort of took up, I think, uh, a lot more... Uh, uh, bandwidth than what would normally be if you were just sort of governing on your own. You then had, uh, yes, it was a, a Brexit referendum called by the Tories, but it's what the country wanted for. And since 2016, obviously, that sucked up so much energy and so much life of Parliament and government oh, time. You're right, Charlie. It's not the Tories' fault at all, is it? It's everyone else's fault. <laughs> yes. It's not the Tories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, of course, and levelling up, but this is the... Uh, you're onto something. Levelling right, up, because, but it never because, happened. Well, I think, um, uh, you know, when Boris Johnson came to power in 2013, uh, 2019, and obviously promised to deliver levelling up. Obviously, we didn't have COVID back then. So the aspiration for the nation, uh, and which is why lots of uh, the Labour heartland seats, that red wall, they voted Conservative yeah. for the first time. You know, Labour had abandoned those areas and therefore they were putting their trust in in, in, in Boris. And I'm afraid since COVID uh, came along, obviously, that was a huge bill, 400 oh, plus billion pounds. Fault. You'll blame um, Brexit next, I presume, um, as well, will you? No, 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 no. Um, but uh, of course, like, you know, mistakes are obviously going to be made along the way. Every government will make mistakes. But I think the overambition... Uh, of levelling up uh, since COVID just hasn't been able to to materialise. You know, money should have gone to those uh, Red Bull seats and to those heartlands where there has been you know, high unemployment in the past, where there has been uh, those waiting lists in the NHS, where there has been uh, uh, social deprivation. You know, uh, So you know, that was the whole point. But since then, obviously, uh, lots of areas have required uh, funding uh, for all different reasons, but it's, mm -hmm. it's tried to be uh, a means to everything rather than uh, uh, targeting particular areas. Well, let's, a shame. let's stick with your mate, Sunak, because uh, Boris Johnson has come out swinging. Let's have a listen to what Boris said about Sunak's smoking ban. We're banning cigars. Mm. And what, what, what is... I mean, maybe, that, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see... Well, what, does, what is the point of banning... Well, the, the party of Winston Churchill wants to ban... <laughs> I mean, donnez-moi donne un break, as they say in Quebec. You know, it, it's, it's just... It, it's just... It's just mad. So, <laughs> absolute madness. It's nuts, Boris says. About, about your pal. You think he's right? Smoking ban, absolute madness? Um, I don't think it's absolute madness. Good. I, Finally, we uh, agree on something. Uh, um, I think it's um, uh, an attempt to try and make sure that the next generation is uh, more healthy, prosperous, uh, um, uh, uh, and have a healthy, prosperous life than, than, than the previous. And I think, you know, um, smoking has been something that has... Uh, been historically um, uh, generationally in the past. So, you know, yes, it was... Um, uh, we, nobody knew about the health impacts mm -hmm. many, many years ago. We very much do know about them now. We don't smoke in public places, you know, for good reason. Uh, so I think, you know, trying to um, eradicate those ills in society is no bad thing. Of course, it calls into question um, how the policy can be implemented because there'll come a time where I know you and I um, of a similar age. <laughs> and, similar ish. Uh, and, yeah. um, uh, you know, I'm 34 next week. And oh, you're really? Not, yes, oh, and you're, gosh, and you're, and I'm you're 39. Not too, you're okay. not too far off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but there'll come a time where, you know, the two of us could, uh, you know, go to a, a shop or an off licence, but one of us, even in our 30s, would be able to buy a packet of cigarettes and the other one wouldn't. So, we're not quite sure how that would work uh, in the very, very long term. Uh, and plus, you can obviously get cigarettes probably from uh, any other part of Europe. But I think the attempt to try and make sure that kids uh, today aren't able to uh, have access to kind of the ill health products or things like smoking or vaping in particular. Where, do, where does it stop? It's cigarettes now. Then in 25 years, they start banning alcohol. Yeah, no, I don't want it. I think it's a good idea for our mm. health, but I'm sorry, we're not, we're not living in China, which actually brings me on to the next point. Mm. China flooding our country with fake stamps. King Charles's face is being printed fakely <laughs> in China, and now it's over here. And, well, it's an outrage. <laughs> it um, is. Um, I, I, it's it's a disgrace. Outrage, as you say. <laughs> but I, again, I, I haven't actually um, bought a stamp for a while. I haven't sent any uh, letters or cards to people. I do apologise to my friends, family and others, uh, the love letters that keep coming in that I, that I haven't responded to. And maybe it's because I've been using fake, fake stamps. But, um, but it is quite worrying because, you know, um, people are buying up these stamps uh, for about 4p a stamp. That's yeah. the, the cost. Um, and they're from wholesalers, they're online, and people think that that's obviously a lot cheaper than buying a stamp today, which I learned was about a pound something, a pound fifty something for a first like class that. Yeah, like I that. wouldn't know. 
So because so, everything is now digitalized anyway. But the idea yeah. that there are people who still like to write a letter, that still like to send a Christmas or birthday card, or even if it's a get well card or you know, um, uh, something uh, worse, if you're of a, you know, a particular age, or if you're older and you lose a, a loved one, you want to be able to send a, yeah. a, a hope you're OK card kind of thing. And so you will go to your um, uh, local post office in the hope that you are uh, uh, getting the right stamp. But uh, the fraud is um, uh, unfortunately allowing them people who receive a letter, uh, they're being slapped with a five pound penalty to go and collect it from the post. Yeah. Why are we being fined? Because some Chinese gang are making some, some small change. Mm. Despicable, absolutely despicable. Charlie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up after the break, we'll be returning to our main story. President Biden, he's promised Israel his ironclad support from the threat of a potential attack by Iran. I'm JJ Nisiobi, in for Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm JJ, in for Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, let's return to our main story today. President Biden has offered his ironclad support to Israel over the imposing threat of an attack from Iran. Tehran has promised the country would retaliate after an Israeli airstrike killed seven people, including two Iranian generals. President Biden's warm words come a day after he previously criticised Benjamin Netanyahu, describing his handling of the war in Gaza as a mistake. Elon Levy, a former spokesperson for the Israeli government, accused the US of throwing his country under a bus. Increasingly, it seems that there is a crisis in relations between Israel and the United States, but President Biden has said Israel has every right to go after Hamas. He hasn't ruled out an operation 
in Rafah. He said he wants to see a plan that will enable civilians to be protected. And Israel is working on such a plan to help evacuate civilians, get them out of harm's way temporarily, so that we can destroy the last four Hamas battalions inside Gaza. Joining me now is Jake Wallace-Simons, editor of the Jewish Chronicle. Good afternoon, Jake. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Hi. Does it concern you how swiftly President Biden goes from criticising Israel on one hand to then pledging his undying support for them? Yes, I mean, the, uh, it, it does uh, concern me. I mean, the, the, the criticism that he's been levelling against Israel has been really alarming and unprecedented uh, over recent weeks because ultimately nothing has really changed. You know, Hamas committed those atrocities on October the 7th, signing its own death warrant, or that should have been the case. Israel then had the job of destroying Hamas while limiting civilian casualties, which it, which it proceeded to do. But over, the, over the, the months that ensued, international pressure informed by Hamas propaganda became very great, and President Biden's own domestic political needs became urgent. And so he began to issue this aggressive rhetoric towards Israel, which was then taken up by other Democrats in his party. But the facts hadn't changed. Uh, but now, you know, it's it's welcome that he's uh, finally come to his senses when seeing that Israel is under existential threat once again from the Iranians. Uh, and so one can only hope that President Biden begins to come to his senses and align his rhetoric with his policy and indeed with the preference of 80 percent of the American public who stand behind Israel in this conflict. So. With the fact that the supreme leader of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, he used a speech to warn Israel after they attacked the, uh, the, the, the Iranian consulates. Do you not think that Biden should perhaps be trying to de-escalate the situation? I feel by him coming out so resolutely to stand with Israel, that's only going to cause more conflict. I think you're, I'm afraid, falling for, uh, into a grave misunderstanding of what's going on now and what has been going on um, between Iran and its neighbours over the last few years. Since Biden came to power, uh, he has been tried to reheat the nuclear deal by negotiations with Iran. Don't forget Donald Trump pulled out of that deal, which was Obama's deal when he was in power. Uh, and Biden has presided over years and years of appeasement of Iran. Uh, these negotiations that he's been carrying out ran into nothing. The Iranians strung him along and at the same time pursued uh, progress towards a bomb. They've now got enough, fissile, enough uh, uranium for one bomb and just working on the weaponization of that. They've embedded their proxy forces uh, and armed them around the region and, they, uh, and have increased their power in that regard. They've used the uh, sanctions money, which the, which the Americans have unfrozen, allowed them to have, to bolster their forces around the region. And they're getting themselves into a position where they can destroy Israel and herald what they want, which is an apocalyptic war. This is a fanatical regime driven by a theology which sees an apocalyptic war as the way to herald messianic times. They want to uh, fulfill a prophecy which sees the return of a, a figure called the Mahdi, an, an invisible figure which will come, come into the real world once an apocalyptic war is, is sparked. That's what they want. That's what they're going for. We need to wise up to that and seek him to not respond to their, uh, to, to their sort of progression, progression towards World War III. It's only to make it worse when it finally comes. Uh, Biden would have done much better to have enforced a policy of deterrent from the beginning rather than waiting until now after years and years of appeasement to finally deal with it when the Iranians begin to reveal the true extent of their plans. And let me tell you, if they come for Israel, they're coming for us too. You know, Iran is a major security threat on British shores. There were 15 assassination attempts that were uh, foiled by MI5 last year, and about 10 the year before. An Iranian dissident journalist was stabbed in West London just a couple of weeks ago in a warning from the Iranian regime. And, and one uh, security official told me quite recently that Iran was the threat that keeps him up at night above all else uh, on our shores in Britain. This is a global menace and a global threat. And the sooner we begin to get tough and deter it, rather than appease it, the better. Well, Jake, I want to ask you about the Israeli foreign minister's comments um, on social media. And these are the foreign minister's comments, not the defence minister, so maybe, maybe not to be taken as seriously. But he said, if Iran attacks from its territory, Israel will react and attack in Iran. But that word territory, we know they have 
uh, the, these factions, Hezbollah, the Houthis, who have been continuously firing missiles across to Israel already. If one of those groups, one of those factions, were to attack Israel or continue to attack, does this not give Iran uh, a way out to say, well, you said from our territory, and actually this wasn't from our territory, this was from, from Yemen or somewhere else instead, or from the Lebanon border? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the game that Iran has been playing for many years. So while pursuing its own build-up of power, nuclear power and ballistic missiles, it's also been funding and supporting and directing proxies, as you've mentioned, throughout the region, from Hezbollah to the Houthis to militia in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, and that has allowed it pl plausible deniability to be able to direct uh, attacks from foreign countries in, in its, using its proxy militia and therefore avoid retaliation. Now, the Israeli defense apparatus has been split in terms of its doctrine to respond to Iran in that way. Under Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister, there was this octopus idea that you hit the head of the octopus, not the tentacles. And during that period, there were lots of Mossad operations on Iranian soil itself. But Netanyahu seems to have gone back to striking the tentacles more than the head of the octopus, as it were. Uh, but in my view, and in the view of many uh, in the defense establishment, both in Israel, in the, in the States and here in Britain, um, I Iran needs to be deterred sooner or later. And it only really will be deterred by strikes on Iranian soil. The, the joint Western power is far, far greater than Iranian power. And we need to realize that and start to uh, flex our muscles a little bit. Now, I'm not saying that we should willfully go into full-scale war with Iran. Nobody wants war. But the only way to avoid a full-scale war is by preventing the buildup of the Iranian threat by mounting an effective deterrent. Without that, all you have is appeasement. And that includes, unfortunately, responding only to the proxies and allowing Iran to get away with this clear dodge. Uh, the longer we do that, the worse the problem will get and the greater the chances of a proper full-scale war. So we need to grasp the metal and enforce deterrent before it's too late. Uh, Jake, one more question for you. The IDF is constructing a northern crossing in Gaza to allow more aid to enter the enclave. It's going to increase from 350 trucks a day to around 500 a day eventually. But how hard must it be for the IDF to know that getting all this aid into Gaza, which is desperately needed by the civilians, is going to also then nourish the terrorists who are hiding amongst them. I mean, look, this is this is one of one of the many impossible dilemmas that Israel faces. You know, a, an Israeli officer uh, said recently that in all the uh, Hamas terrorists that he had seen captured and killed, there wasn't one single one that looked in any way hungry. So the aid is getting in, but it's getting mainly or primarily to Hamas, uh, and this is a real problem. You know, uh, Israel. Uh, there are voices in Israel that say, look. We're at war. Let's not send in very much aid because our objective is to beat Hamas. And by sending in aid, we are obstructing our own objectives. But the main Israeli uh, principle is not to harm civilians. And so to, to feed them is part of that. And yet it's become this great political issue, both in Israel and with pressure from the outside. Um, you know, people, armchair critics sitting here in Britain who don't have children on the front line, who don't live in places that would be bombed by Hamas if they could, are very easily able to say, look, let's just have a ceasefire, send them the aid, and let's just be nice. But unfortunately, whenever being nice has been tried in the past, it has ended up with a massacre of Jews. And so Israel needs to defend itself. And obviously, you know, personally, I want to see Gazans well-fed, well-cared for in a prosperous, safe, and secure country. They had the opportunity to build that country in 2005 when Israel withdrew and gave them the keys. Unfortunately, then there was a Hamas coup and takeover, and the rest is history. So Israel does find itself in a very difficult position. And yet ultimately, uh, Israel does need to deliver a lot of aid into Gaza because that is the main issue that's preoccupying the United States, with good reason. Um, and United States support is essential for Israel to continue to prosecute the war if it can do, which I think it should be able to do so uh, in order to destroy Hamas and win the peace. Jake Wallace Simons, thank you for your time. Thank you. Moving on now, and J.K. Rowling says she won't forgive Harry Potter stars Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson for their views on transgender rights. The author has accused the actors of cozying up to a movement intent on eroding women's hard-won rights. Rowling's also said the stars use their platforms to promote the transitioning of children. It follows the release of the CAS report into gender treatment services in the UK. 
Let's speak now to Jo Phoenix, professor in criminology at Reading University. She won an employment tribunal against the Open University after she was sacked because she was accused of transphobia. Jo, thank you for joining me. Um, thank you very much for having me. It turns out yourself and J.K. Rowling were right all along. So, did Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson owe her an apology? Oh, uh, well, um, I don't know if they owe her an apology. I don't know uh, if apologies even fit here. Uh, and instead of talking about rolling, um, what I'd like to do is talk more generally about this because uh, every single one of us who have been engaged in this fight in one way or another, either as professional academics or as activists or whatever, have been trying to sound the warnings uh, about what the impact of going down uh, the kind of trans um, ideology, for lack of better words, uh, is. Uh, and we've not just been sounding the, the klaxons about the harm to children um, and, and women in prisons and women in refuges. Uh, we've also been saying that there is a very strong contingent of people, maybe a small number, who are actively trying to stop us even being able to say this. So when the cast report came out yesterday, um, I was watching on Twitter and there were many people who were going, well, thank goodness somebody's finally come into the room with the evidence that we've been saying is happening all along. And then the mood changed um, and the mood changed to why did we have to do this? Uh, and then the mood changed to the absolute extreme sadness that so many of us have felt when the, the perfectly reasonable things we've been trying to say about the harm that this does to actual people, um, when you suddenly realize that there is that harm that sits there. Now, you asked about apologies. I think there's like two different elements to this. Uh, and I'll talk personally here about the OU. There were 368 people who signed a letter to try and get the research center that I was part of uh, run out of town, basically. Uh, the employment tribunal found it was harassment and discrimination and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, if any one of those 368 people tried to apologize to me, I know two things about that. The apology is worthless, right? Because, you know, I was run out of town um, uh, and all of the heartache, right? So that apology is worthless. The other apology is worthless, um, or it's worthless on another level, because it doesn't do anything to stop the fact that, that academic voices in this area and people who have been trying to warn government and others that harm is being done, it doesn't do anything to, to bring that back. Um, so if there's any apologies that have to be given, it's to the women and the children that have been harmed by this movement. Um, and there's one other thing I want to add. There's another element to this that uh, people forget about. These were human relationships. Um, I, uh, the people who harassed me and, and discriminated against me, they were people I'd known for a couple of decades. So there's a level of personal betrayal that goes on uh, with this. And the, the thing about that personal betrayal, no apology will help because the people who did these things knew what they were doing. Um, there are some apologies that might help. The bystanders who may have been too afraid to speak up, uh, for instance, those may help. But the rest of it, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, now that we know, particularly the cast report, about how many children have been harmed by, um, you know, medical transitioning, um, the cast report was so damning. Anyone who supported the transitioning of children in the manner that we were doing it has that those those harms on their hands. Um, so, yeah, I actually agree with her. Um, you know, the OU offered me an apology. I think it's worse worse than useless. You know, I don't care about their apologies. I don't care about the apology of the the uh, vice chancellor. I didn't care about the apology of the vice chancellor from Essex University when they were found to have unlawfully treated me because they are absolutely useless in this area because so many of us have been trying to have our voice heard moderately uh, for so long. So, <clears throat> Professor, uh, why do you think it is that with so much underwhelming evidence that puberty blockers and other hormones, uh, hormone uh, medicine was there was not, nowhere near enough evidence to suggest that this was going to help. It, we didn't know the long-term effects of it. But why was it so that a few of the loudest voices on social media were able to influence a whole medical community into silence? 
Well, you know, uh, that's I, I want to say that's the one million dollar question, but we know why. Uh, we know why, and it, it kind of links a little bit to what your previous um, uh, presenter was talking about, and that was about people just want to be nice. You know, when when all of these, you know, gender affirmative care was being brought in, when people like myself who were being shouted down and told that we were transphobes, you've got a whole realm of bystanders around you, um, and many of those bystanders stand out of the way uh, and because they just want everyone to be kind. Um, but then, uh, with regards to gender affirmative care, you've got key activist organizations that manage to get into uh, clinical practice uh, in a way to, to really shut down people being cautious uh, about what they were doing with children. And of course, we know those organizations, don't we? Stonewall, um, you know, has absolutely. had some... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Professor Joe Phoenix, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Some breaking news that's come into us at Talk TV now. OJ Simpson, the former American football star, has died at the age of 76. In a message on X, his family said, on April 10th, our father, Orenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. The former NFL player who stood trial for the double murder of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman in the 90s, only to be acquitted, passed away in Las Vegas. We'll bring you more on that story as we have it. Coming up after the break, Prince Harry's visa application has officially been handed over to a federal judge and could soon be exposed to the public. I'm JJ in for Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. Some breaking news that's come into us at Talk TV. OJ Simpson, the former American football star, has died at the age of 76. In a message on X, his family said, on April 10th, our father, Arenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. The former NFL player who stood trial for the double murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, in the 90s, only to be acquitted, passed away in Las Vegas. And we'll bring you more on that story as we have it. I'm joined now by Talk TV presenter Daisy McAndrew. Daisy, this is shocking, shocking news. Yeah, I think to those of us of a certain generation, and I count myself at 51 as being <laughs> of that generation, O.J. Simpson was such a big figure. And then, of course, his case was one of those moments where not just America stopped and was fixated on, on you know, every turn of the trial, but really the world was. It was one of the first seminal trials that mm. everybody wanted. You know, you'd get back from school or work and say, you know, what happened at the OJ trial today? And he's continued, obviously, to be a you know, deeply controversial uh, figure. And as you said, acquitted of that, uh, you know, was... Um, convicted of, of on other trials, but an astonishing story going from you know, this one of the most famous American sportsmen ever, right. then to you know sort of criminal, would be criminal, um, and then always a controversial figure. Yeah, I guess for some of our younger viewers and listeners, OJ played for the Buffalo Bills, the San Francisco 49ers. He was essentially he was bigger than David Beckham was in Beckham's day yeah, in, terms, exactly. in terms of global sport. He was getting advertising campaign sponsorship deals all over the shop. He was the, the dream boy of and, American sports. And then moved into acting, which was really unusual in those days. Of course, nowadays we see people like, you know, The Rock, who go from, uh, or Vinnie Jones, or whoever yeah. it might be, you know, who, who go from acting into Hollywood and mm -hmm. into, into movies. Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously one of the you know, most obvious. Ronald Reagan doing it from acting into politics. You know, you have these figures, but they are few and far between, and OJ was one of those. Well, you say Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's funny because the Terminator was supposed to be played by O.J. Simpson, and he actually turned it down and it went to Arnold Schwarzenegger instead. But I remember being a kid and seeing that car chase un yeah. unrolling on television. The, the white Ford Bronco, I think it was, going down the freeway, Dozens of police cars, helicopters, the press were all over it. Yeah, and nowadays we're quite used to seeing, particularly in the States, you know, there's the first sign or first sighting of a, of a car chase and they send up the, you know, the news helicopter and, yeah. and we see it then. But again, it was such a big deal. It was like a movie, you know, a dramatic yeah. movie being being played out in front of our very eyes. And, you know, so Rolling News was relatively new in those... I know mm. I'm sounding like a complete granny now. <laughs> you know, you know, think, but things were really different yeah. in those days. You know, Rolling News, helicopter cams, all the rest of it. Super Hollywood sporting superstars accused, accused of murder. I mean, yeah. it was an astonishing story. And at the time, politically, Los Angeles was a racial hotbed because a few years prior, Rodney King had been beaten up by police officers, white police officers had been beaten to the floor. It was caught on camera and they had the famous LA riots about that. Yeah, and of course, you know, um, this was an interracial marriage, yeah. which was still relatively unusual mm. then. And, you know, and there was, as you know, there, there was an element of racism. The other thing that I've been reminded recently, I've been watching a lot of, I, don't hate me for this, Kardashians with my teenage, with my teenage daughter. This is where and, it began. and of course, we're reminded that, you know, um, the Kardashian father was OJ's attorney, and was, yeah. you know, completely involved in, in that case um, and remained, I think, close friends. And that, you know, obviously, he took a lot of heat uh, yeah. from being, you know, from representing OJ. Yeah. Um, so technically, we can blame OJ Simpson for the Kardashians because that's that is where the notoriety started. Robert Kardashian Senior at the time, and then it just spilled out to the rest of them. But going back to the trial, another iconic uh, moment from that for me was the glove. OJ Simpson trying to put a fit on the black glove and claiming it, it doesn't fit. It was too small. It was too small. And, and people there, you can you can see it there on the screen. Um, and people have, have you know, talked about this for years ever since, saying that, you know, he, he was showing off his acting skills. Like, yeah. pretty, you know, it looked like he was pretending, oh, I can't, like Cinderella, you know, all the ugly sisters trying to get their feet into the, you know, into <laughs> the, the glass slipper, that it was a sort of similar thing. But again, a completely iconic legal moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was also really fascinating is that 22 years after the, the trial, and he was acquitted for the murder of uh, Nicole Brown and 
her friend, Ron, Ron Goldman. Ron Goldman. Yeah, we keep saying friend, I'm not sure why. But um, 22 years afterwards, Netflix, American Crime Story, it was all, all relived all over again with David Schwimmer, pretty much an all-star cast. David Schwimmer played Robert Kardashian uh, in that Netflix uh, drama series. Uh, but it, it, just, it just brought everything back to life and added more colour. I remember watching that series and thinking, I mean, obviously, I was a kid when the initial trial happened. I was like, I don't remember that happening. I don't yeah. remember this happening. And there was there all these theories about Robert Kardashian removing the suit that may have had blood on and taking it yeah. in front of the front of the world's press. And it's it's been extraordinary, actually. Netflix have done so many of these um, either dramatizations or docudramas or, or documentaries. You know, whether or not it was about Monica Lewinsky or Michael Jackson or you know all these these huge stories that then bring it to life for another generation that you know, most of, certainly I think most of the people who saw that OJ documentary wouldn't have remembered it first time around. They wouldn't have remembered Monica Lewinsky, yeah. you know, Michael Jackson. And it does show the power that those, you know, those shows and those Hollywood executives have, depending on what angle they're going to take, yeah. that they will influence. I mean, we've talked about this as a difference. This isn't about you know, criminal cases, but even the way that they've put the crown together has changed a whole generation's view of historical royal occasions yeah. just because Netflix has the power to do it. And Cuba Gooding Jr., who played OJ in the Netflix uh, series, even he got flack for, for playing the role of OJ yeah. Simpson. Um, now, OJ, I would say after the trial and his acquittal, his life never really went back to being what it was before. He was never the, the superstar again. Well, People no, didn't want to be around him. But because the cloud of suspicion never left him. Yeah. That was, you know, it was as simple as that. And yet, whilst, you know, you couldn't write in a newspaper, OJ was guilty because you'd be you know, very liable for libel and slander. Yeah. You know, so people didn't, but the cloud never went away. Yeah, this is true. And he ended up going into prison again, um, of course. He was arrested for stealing his own merchandise. Plenty of strange occurrences for him in his later life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it'll be fascinating now that he is dead to see what, because I would imagine the floodgates will open now. Mm -hmm. Now that you know, litigation, you know, you can't be sued by somebody yeah. who's dead. Litigation is, is no longer an issue. And I would bet my bottom dollar that that Netflix uh, show will be back on our screens it will very, be. very soon. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Daisy. Pleasure. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show, but thank you for tuning in. Please do join me again, same time tomorrow. Up next, it's the wonderful Vanessa Feltz. But for me, it's goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth.